It is Tuesday, January 14, 2014, and we are in St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm asking, I'm going to ask the first question of you, which is to tell us your name mm -hmm. and spell it. All right. Uh, my f complete name is Danelle Edlin Cohn, D U N E W -L, L. Edlin is E D L I N, and the last name is Cohn, C O H N. Very good. <laughs> I spelled it all correctly, and I've always gone by the name Don or Donnie. Uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. Donnie in the old days, and Don so, so in the last Don fifty years. With a U or no, no, just no. yeah, yeah. I never was called Danelle by anybody. It was sort of an honorific name. Um, they were given to really to recognize people that had been important to my parents. So. Well, we know you're an Oak Ridge war baby. Mm -hmm. Um, and we want to know about you, but should we start by talking about um, your parents? Sure. Well, my connection to Oak Ridge is definitely through my parents. Um, my mother was um, Charmian Cone, uh, married my father in April of 1943. Um, Could you spell Charmian? Charmian is C H A R M I A N, and her last name was Edwin, which is my middle name. Um, she married my father in April of 1943 in Chicago, um, just prior to his leaving to go down to Oak Ridge, Tennessee for the, as part of the Manhattan Project. They lived in Chicago for, I don't know, maybe five months or so, and then um, moved to Site X in Tennessee. Uh, my father was Waldo Cohn, um, W-A-L-D-O, <laughs> um, who came originally from Berkeley, California, and then um, after graduate school and getting his doctorate, went to Harvard um, for a few years and then was tapped by the Manhattan Project to join, join, well, to join the project um, as an expert in radioisotopes, which he had used as a graduate student, and hence moved to Chicago first and then to Oak Ridge. And his job was really to Developed techniques for separating the fission products from the nuclear reactor. Um, he had a lot of expertise in, in separating, in separation techniques. He had developed a technique called ion exchange chromatography, um, which turns out to be a very general um, and powerful technique for separating chemicals. Um, and he originally applied that to separating fission products from the reactor. A lot of this had to be done with remote techniques, so these columns that he built and, and ran had to be operated with mechanical hands behind wetted glass and, and so on. Um, but it turned out to be a very powerful technique for separating things. And then after the war, he used that technique to um, turn it to biochemical ends and separating the nucleotides and nucleosides that make up um, RNA, ribonucleic acid. And that was his career really, really was built on, on that application of separation techniques that he developed during the war, but now devoted to biochemistry. Anyhow, That's yeah. perfect. You, <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, we just heard a, bit, a snippet on mm -hmm. your dad's tape. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could give us a little um, back up to where he was born, how he happened sure. to... Sure. You know, yeah, he was it. born in Alameda, California, which is part of Oakland, um, California, right next to Berkeley. Um, in 1910, and um, went to school there. He had the oldest of two, two boys. Um, and I guess in about 1925 or so, his parents moved the family to Berkeley, California, um, as he says on his tape, to be close to the university because they hoped he would go there and he could walk to the university. And so that's what happened. <laughs> So I guess in around 1918, he entered the University of California at Berkeley um, and became a chemistry major. Um, and after four years, went on to graduate school and gradually moved over into the more biochemical realm. But um, as his, part of his graduate studies, um, began to use radioisotopes to study biological systems really the beginning of radioisotope tracer work with biological, biological, um, bio, biological problems. 
um, mostly with phosphorus 32, but also sodium um, and other um, ions, radioactive um, radioisotopes of various ions that you could try and track through mice or rats, trying to see you know, where they got deposited, how long did it take to clear um, those kinds of early studies using tracers to look at living organisms. So these were tracers that were made in the cyclotron um, at Berkeley. And these were, this was work that was in the early 1930s, 1932, 35, that sort of time period. So he then, let's see, that he stayed at Berkeley until when? Probably about 1938, I believe. Um, he um, got his PhD and then he was, he took a job at Harvard as a, I don't know what they called them, um, not a tutor, but something like that. So I think in 1938, my father got his PhD and moved then to Harvard. And he was at Harvard for about four years, um, doing sort of postgraduate work. Um, and it was at Harvard then that he was tapped to join the Manhattan Project because of his expertise in using radioisotopes. Okay, this right. is great, good. So, so from Harvard, he then in 1940, late 42, I think October or so, 42, maybe September, uh, moved to Chicago where the Manhattan Project was setting up and was there for about six months before um, being moved to Oak Ridge. Uh, I was in, and finally moved to Oak Ridge in, um, when was it April? No, it was probably about October of 1943. And do you know what he was doing in, in Chicago? Um, he was, I think, beginning to work on techniques that might be applicable to separating these fission products, but it was all sort of a, a hypothetical at that point. It was you know, if indeed a reactor could be built and would be built in Oak Ridge, um, it was really preparatory to that because there wasn't a reactor to deal with. Um, Fermi's pile um, had been built, and so they knew the concept at least of, of a chain reaction was possible and sort of the dynamics of what they wanted to build, this graphite reactor. Um, but that work didn't really start until the reactor was up and running in Oak Ridge, which was later in 1943, um, I believe they went online. Um, so at that point he moved to Oak Ridge and as they applied these techniques to try and separate fission products, partly to have them then analyzed for their health risks and benefits. Um, you know, he would prepare samples, I think they went to health physicists um, back in Chicago or in other places to try and you know, figure out what these isotopes might do, um, you know, whether they were toxic or not toxic and so on, those kinds of things. He was involved, I think, in that work directly, but in separating these, these products. So he worked actually on the reactor um, you know, taking samples from it, feeding in materials to expose them to neutron bombardment, um, and then purifying the things that came out of the reactor and separating the components that were, were there. That's very interesting, um, especially because uh, in looking at how they separated these fission products, to get the plutonium mm -hmm. at Hanford, it's a, it's a huge process. Yeah, now he wasn't interested in separating the plutonium. He was interested in the, the smaller things that are produced by fissioning of these large nuclei of uranium and so on, of, of the breakdown products that occur. And so there are, you know, there are lots of them, and it was not totally predictable what, what they would be and so on. So that was, that was the job he was involved with. And again, I think they're interested in their health. The, the health physicists were interested in, in these products and what they would do. Um, from that work, probably the most important part of what he did in Oak Ridge, 
um, was something that came out of that, which was not part of the original plan. And that was that he realized that you could use the reactor to produce radioisotopes in large quantities that could then be used for medical and biological research. And so probably his major, well, one of his two major scientific contributions was the development of a radioisotope program. Um, he packaged and sent off the first radioisotopes produced in the reactor for that purpose of medical biological research and really started the radioisotope program at Oak Ridge. He and a man named Abersold, Abersold, his A-B-R, A-B-E-R-S-O-L-D, um, began this, this the radioisotope program. And I know that um, his friend and the person who was the head of the Oak Ridge Laboratories for many years after, after the war, Alvin Weinberg, um, basically decided that as sort of the, one of the major contributions that the whole Manhattan Project and, and Oak Ridge facility had made to the world was developing this program of, of making radioisotopes available. And of course they've had unlimited applications in research and therapy and, and so on. So that was an important, an important contribution that sort of came out of the, the war effort, even though it wasn't a direct you know, objective. Absolutely. I actually had a chance to meet Alvin Weinberg. Oh, you did? I did. Yeah. Well, Alvin Weinberg was a very, very close friend. Probably my parents' closest friends were the Weinbergs, and I grew up with their children, and he was, they were, they were family. <laughs> and in Oak Ridge, strangers, not strangers, and people who were not related to one another really did become family because there, there was another family. And so there were very close relationships developed. And certainly ours with the Weinbergs was one of those. Well, he was highly revered. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, so tell me more about um, what happened next. You, you left us with mm -hmm. Shaomian and marrying your dad. And right. He had been previously married. And right. He had been previously married. I don't know, probably got married around 1938 or so, maybe 37, um, to an, a fellow graduate student from Berkeley um, who was also a scientist. And they together went to Harvard, and they had a son in 1940, October of 1940, my brother Marcus, Mark. Um, and about a year after that, his wife died, I believe of ovarian cancer, I'm not positive. And he was left with a one-year-old child, and um, again, it was about a year after that probably, maybe not even a year after that, that he was then pulled into the Manhattan Project. But he had basically to figure out how to care for this child and continue a career and, and so on. And during that time he leaned on close friends. Um, and two of them were the family of the Coriels, C-O-R-Y-E-L-L, -L, and the Dunlaps. Um, and because of their importance to him during that period. When I was born, several years later, I was named Donnell after those two families. Um, my mother actually met my father in Boston at a party, a going away party for him. Um, he was moving to Chicago again to begin this, this new project. And she happened to be in Boston visiting a friend of hers and met my father at a party and they began to correspond and decided to get married. And six months after they met, having never seen each other again after that first weekend, um, she took a train from New York to Chicago. And my father made special arrangements so that they could actually get the medical test and the license and get married the day she arrived. Because she didn't, he didn't want to um, sort of have her spend the night with him without being married. <laughs> so they made special arrangements because of the war to get a special dispensation to get married that day. So she arrived in Chicago and they got married. And um, 
Then they lived in Chicago for almost six months, I guess, before moving to Oak Ridge. During that time, my brother had been sent to live with my father's mother in Berkeley with his grandmother uh, to take care of him. And so shortly after they got married, my parents took the train out to California and picked up my brother, brought him back. And then he ended up, of course, moving to Oak Ridge with, with them. And um, I said, I arrived in April of, I mean, in May of 1944, about 11 months, no, 13 months after they got married, but in Oak Ridge. One of the sort of the first crop of babies <laughs> born at the Oak Ridge Hospital. Um, which is also an interesting sort of story because the whole setup in Oak Ridge was so unusual, again, being a, a government town that was sort of created out of not quite nothing, but almost nothing. Um, the hospital was, you could think of it as a great experiment in socialized medicine. Um, it was, you know, um, you know, everybody got care there. Um, and basically at the government's expense. And um, there were aspects of Oak Ridge that were really unusual in that way. And so some people have looked at Oak Ridge as sort of a social experiment in, in a sort of a radical sort of um, way to, to, to build a community. Um, so you know, there's an aspect of it to, the, to it that had this sort of, you know, this sort of intellectual sort of um, sort of overlayer to it, but it was a town where there was no unemployment, there was no extreme poverty. Um, you know, it didn't have the the kinds of um, things that just you know, the regular places sort of have as part of their their history. Um, so everybody there had a job, which is not the way most communities are. Um, so it was, it was a very unusual place in that way. And of course, a lot of PhDs, a lot of very educated people and engineers and, and so on. So if you can recall, mm -hmm. um, Charmian had some observations that she wrote in a letter to mm -hmm. her parents. Yeah, I, I found a letter that she had written three days after she got married, April, April 17th. Um, writing to her parents and just um, telling them how she had found herself sort of in this intellectual hothouse um, where everybody she met seemed to be more brilliant than the next and they were from Stanford and Berkeley and Harvard and, and so on and they all were very intense, hard, you know, working at this secret government project that she didn't know much about or anything about and telling them they weren't going to find anything about it either but that she would be, is going to be moving to this site X um, somewhere in the south. And she said, in a state that I never thought I would live in. I think she probably thought she would never live outside of New York City. She was a real New York City girl. <laughs> and um, I think it was a shock to her system to find herself in a, you know, this um, sort of half-built city um, that was Oak Ridge with... Um, you know, no sidewalks and lots of mud and houses going up left and right and um, you know, certainly a, not what she had expected probably from her life. And that was true, I think, of a lot of um, her friends and compatriots, the, the women of Oak Ridge, the, not the working women, but the women, of the, the wives of the scientists who um, were mostly, again, big city, university, educated women who found themselves in this town with um, you know, no history, no culture, no facilities. Um, you know, it was a, a real frontier sort of feeling to it. And um, in fact, I think they thought of themselves sort of as frontiersmen, um, the people who went to Oak Ridge. They were sort of carving a sort of an intellectual space in the wilderness. Um, so again, that was a, a feeling I think that really permeated the town for at least a decade after the war. Um, sort of the decade I grew up in was you know, this 
feeling of really having made a town out of nothing um, themselves and great, great civic pride and, and um, developed in Oak Ridge. So my mother who denied for probably four or five years that she lived in Oak Ridge and always tell me she was from New York, but she happened to be living in Tennessee, um, gradually became an ardent cheerleader for, for Oak Ridge and the, the physical beauty and the community um, that was part of this, this experiment. Um, and I think actually that, that physical beauty actually attracted a lot of people um, in Oak Ridge. It was, became a, I think they all appreciated sort of the, just the forests and the contours of these mountains around them. Um, so that was a, another aspect of the town anyway. So Ken, you describe, what, where, did the, um, where did she live? When they arrived. When they arrived, I don't know where they, whether they had a house when they first arrived. There are some postcards I have where my father sort of talks about getting settled, but he's not talking about this town. And there's references to Gatlinburg in these letters. And I'm not sure if he really was in Gatlinburg or if this was sort of like a fiction, um, of a way to refer to a place but not actually saying quite what it was. I mean, everybody knew it was near Knoxville. Um, but um, I know the first house they moved into and that, that I, they were in when I was born um, was one of these semesto houses that were put up to house the community. Um, there were basically five basic designs of, well, actually really four basic designs of houses and then there were apartments that were built and so on, but there were B and C and D and F houses. I don't know what happened to E houses. They left them out somehow. Um, the B houses had two bedrooms. I think the C's maybe also did. The D's and F's had three bedrooms. They were all built of a material called semesto, which is, a, I don't know quite what it is. Um, they were built supposedly to last you know, a few years, um, they're still there. <laughs> um, most of them have been renovated, but there's still the, the basic plan is there. One thing that was really nice about Oak Ridge as a planned community is that um, Skid Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, I guess, are the people who designed the town. Um, they really followed the contours of this hill, these hills and made streets that curved and bent and they left a lot of trees. They didn't knock all the trees down to put these houses in. And they put all the houses at different angles. So that even though you know, every fourth house was an F house, it didn't look the same. They didn't, you know, they didn't immediately, they weren't all facing the, the, the street you know, at the same angle and so on. And so it really had a, a nice appearance to it as compared to what it could have been, but, um, which I think could have been a very regimented sort of army town. Um, and so um, the, the center of the town it was built all of these houses, then gradually Oak Ridge just spread wider and wider out into the neighboring communities um, and you know, has become you know, developed suburbs of its own and so on, although it's not a very big town itself, but it's almost become linked to Knoxville now um, in terms of uh, being able to get around. It used to be that Knoxville was quite a trip from Oak Ridge um, through backcountry roads, and it was a major, major deal to go to, to Knoxville to shop or something like that. And now it's just a zip down the, the highway. Um, I think what else? I can say. Do you remember yeah. um, something about the, can you tell us something about the layout where the shopping centers were and well yeah there were a few I mean the the the, the one of course that was in the, really in the center of town was Jackson Square um, uh, and it's still there Jackson Square fairly unchanged in terms of its geometry um, there was a, a theater there was I think three movie theaters in the early days in Oak Ridge um, one of them was in Jackson Square um, there was a, a drugstore there and a men's clothing store and, and so on. And close to that was the big guest hotel that 
visiting scientists and so on staying in the Alexandra Hotel. And close to that was a church that was a uh, interdenominational church. We just got, called it the Church on the Hill. And um, that's still there also. I think now it's, a, I don't know if it's a Methodist church or not. Do you know? I, I don't remember what denomination it is now. But it was an interdenominational church. And actually the second house I lived in was very close to, to that on Kingfisher Lane. It was just um, up from Jackson Square. And we used to go sweating on the church on the hill, and the, you know, on the, in the front of it and so on. And walk down to the, the movie theater to see double features at the center theater, I think it was called that one. And, um, but there were other shopping centers. There was one in Pine Valley. Um, there was one in, um, oh, what's it called? The Grove Center, near where the big swimming pool is. Um, there were recreational facilities in town. Again, the Army built things big and, and, and pretty well. So we had a gigantic swimming pool that's still in Oak Ridge, but it was um, a huge pool and a center for recreation. There was, um, you know, in the early days, there obviously were dances and so on, the rec hall and that sort of thing. But I, I didn't, that's the only things I know by pictures and rumors. <laughs> um, the schools in Oak Ridge were very good. They had, um, good teachers that came from, a lot of them from neighboring areas, but some from farther away. Again, everybody in Oak Ridge was sort of brought in from the outside in one way or another. And so they were not extremely Southern in their feel. They were a little more, not international, but sort of national schools, I guess. And of course, there were a lot of bright kids and kids who had parents who valued education and pushed education. So they did a, they did a great job and, and were very successful schools. I think they probably still are um, very highly ranked as um, public education. Um, i trying to think what else about schools. What about know. your mom here? Yeah. She's now just arrived and uh, soon enough yeah. has, has two babies and how does she live day to day and what's her well, life I, like? Well, I don't know a lot about that. I know a little bit later on about it. Um, but those first few years I really don't know much about except that I know it was a struggle in terms of dealing with you know the mud and the lack of transportation and the women in general tended to be sort of um, sort of trapped. They didn't have cars to go driving around town um, and so on. They basically had to be at home with their, their babies. Um, but they did band together and my mother formed very, very strong friendships um, in those early, early days that lasted her whole life. Um, and um, But soon after you know, things began to settle in Oak Ridge, um, these women became avid and ardent volunteers in, in a variety of ways. Um, and, and again, building community structures, um, whether it was the playhouse or the, the musical um, sort of community. My father, again, had founded this symphony, and we'll get to that. But my mother became a um, sort of founding member of the Civic Music Association that supported the symphony and the chorus and raised money and did publicity and all of that. Other friends became involved in forming a playhouse. Um, and people who were not particular actors, like my mother acted in plays in the early 1950s um, at the playhouse. Um, an art center was formed. Um, my mother became very involved with um, uh, reading for the blind and doing braille labels and things like that for so they, they took up volunteer activities, um, and but again, those are memories that really come from a little later period than really during the war. I'd so can you, um, through conversations you've mm -hmm. had with your dad and other mm -hmm. materials subsequently, talk about what it was like for him during the war? Well, I think they worked very hard. Um, 
so I think there was an intensity to it, particularly in the, in the war years, that there was a sense of urgency. Um, you know, clearly things were secret and sort of compartmentalized. My father, I think, was one of the scientists who knew pretty well what was going on, although I don't know how much he knew about the structure of a bomb particularly, but he certainly knew that the that plutonium was being produced in the reactor and, and so on and what it was for. Um, but, um, but again, there was this, um, that wasn't shared with the wives. Um, there was very little discussion of that outside of work. Um, so I think that must have been a very strange kind of thing. These are people who are intensely involved in their work and their work sort of almost defines them in, in many ways. But it was only at work. But um, they used to work fairly long days and Saturdays for sure. Um, but I, I remember, at least as a kid, that he almost always was home for dinner. That, you know, the, that there was some regularity to their schedules or to his schedule, at least, where he would come home at 6 o'clock or so and we'd have dinner together. Um, I think... Again, there was a headiness to all this new science um, that, that everybody was really excited about, I think, um, and very involved in. Um, again, I mean, the men also, I think, formed very close relationships through that work. Um, I know just carpooling and so on. There weren't a lot of cars and a lot of ways to get around town, so... They would carpool to go to the labs and, and so on. And, um, you know, again, families sort of became sort of integrated in some ways uh, with one another. Um, now, his work with the project really came to an end fairly quickly after the war. Um, and he then joined what was, um, became the biology division um, that was housed at Y-12 in the... Um, laboratory area there, and turned, again, his um, expertise in separation techniques to biochemistry, back to where he had come from before the war, and went on with that work for the rest of his career. So why don't you um, talk about how he got involved in uh, this music as a child, mm -hmm. and then what that led to at Oak Ridge? Well, <laughs> He got involved in music as a child, um, took up the cello as a youngster. Um, his parents were pretty disappointed, his mother particularly, and I, this is the stories again I've heard is that he had practiced three half hours a day and that his mother would sit there and watch him, make sure that he practiced those, those times. <laughs> um, he began to take lessons actually in San Francisco in a fairly early age, actually. He would take the ferry from Alameda across to San Francisco and then take a cable car or a bus to his teacher's place and back. A fairly long trip. And he became a quite accomplished and a pretty serious musician. Um, played a lot of chamber music with people who went on to become he was the concertmaster of the San Francisco Symphony. He played with Isaac Stern, who was a, a youngster when my father was already in graduate school. Um, but he played with a lot of good musicians. And um, music became a very important part of his, his social life and his self-identity. And when he got to Oak Ridge, he, of course, had his cello with him. I don't know how he got it there. Um, probably just... You know, carried along on the train. I don't know any stories about that. Um, but immediately after he got there, looked for people to play music with and started to play, found people to play some chamber music and then gradually a little bit larger groups and invited more people. And um, in, I guess, the fall of 40, 1943, which was really not a month or two after he'd gotten there, his little group of musicians had gotten too big for the house they were not in a very big house, and they were in a, a C house at that point. Um, so they found a place at the high school to play, 
and gradually they started to play a little as sort of a string orchestra and then added some winds and finally got to be too big to run itself and they needed a conductor and told my father you started this you conduct it and so my father had, had a lot of experience in good orchestras in berkeley and i think also at harvard but certainly at berkeley had played a lot of music and he really taught himself to conduct um, and he founded the symphony which gave his first concert in the spring of 1944 um, I think the first concert actually was a month after I was born. There's some sort of story again, which I don't quite recollect about him being called out of rehearsal um, when my mother went into labor and so on and rushing down to the hospital. Um, but I think in June of 44 was the first concert by the, the whole symphony. And he conducted it for 11 years. And then after that played cello in it for another, I don't know, maybe 20 years or maybe more, I'm trying to think. He conducted it up until 1955, and he finally retired, I think, from playing cello basically in 85 or 86, something like that. Um, no? no? <laughs> okay, maybe I can't add correctly. It's okay. <laughs> Anyhow, he played as long as he could finally, he could play. Finally, his arthritis and bad shoulders got to the point where he didn't feel he could really do it um, that well. So finally around the age of 80 or so he retired from performing. So, but in addition to the orchestra he also they founded a, a series of concerts, amateur chamber concerts, they called coffee concerts. Um, and again his, he had a few quartets but one major one that would perform you know, probably once a year in those, but other than other groups, soloists and so on would play. There was a lot of music in Oak Ridge and a lot of scientists were amateur musicians. Um, Alvin Weinberg, whom you mentioned, was a very good pianist um, and occasionally would give concerts um, on the piano. Um, but that was true of a lot of, there were a lot of scientists um, who were musicians and so we had a very strong music community. Um, so anyhow, that's, my father's involvement, he, he founded the symphony and ran it for a long time. And I guess at the beginning, he really did run the whole thing. I mean, there's a, his secretary, who was uh, Dottie Silverman, Dorothy Silverman, wrote a thing about, about the beginning of the symphony and how you know, Waldo would set up the chairs and set up the music stands and arrange the music. And you know, he sort of did from the janitorial to the conducting aspects of the symphony. Um, but he, he loved it, and I think actually that was his great pleasure in life, was, was the music. Um, the science, you know, he certainly got rewards from that and traveled a lot and spoke and got recognition, but I think the music was, you know, probably his, his first love or his, his real love. <laughs> That's great. Um, you mentioned uh, also that he had been, he had been involved in uh, desegregation. Yeah, he, again, in Oak Ridge, people tended to do lots of things. And um, Oak Ridge was governed by a city council. It wasn't governed, it was governed by the government, by the army. But they set up a citizens' advisory council. It basically was like a city council. Um, they would meet and make recommendations to the government uh, about things you know, having to do with running the town. And my father, um, became a member of the city council and actually became the head of the city council, the mayor of Oak Ridge, I think in 1952 or so. And one of the things he proposed was to integrate the schools. Um, at that point, the army had the position that it should not do things counter to local traditions of course, Oak Ridge had really no local traditions, but the area certainly did, and that was of segregation. And Oak Ridge had been set up with a very clearly demarcated area for African Americans. Um, and they had their own schools, and they didn't go to the public schools, they didn't go to the public high school. They went to a, I think a school in Knoxville, maybe. Um, but anyway, my father felt the school should be integrated and got a resolution passed to the city council to recommend this to the 
to the government to integrate the schools. And the government turned them down and said, no, this would you know, cause discord. And they didn't want any discord. And you know, they were going to honor local traditions. Um, and there were a number of people in the community. Again, this is a, a southern town overlaid with this international scientific community. Um, people took great exception to this, and they actually had a recall election um, for, to get him out of office, and they succeeded, actually. They, he was recalled in 1953. Uh, very shortly after that, of course, the Brown versus Board of Education decision came down to the Supreme Court in 54, and one of the sort of untold stories of Oak Ridge is that it was probably the first community in the South to honor that decision and in 1955 integrated the schools with no problems and no disruption. Um, again, they were done by neighborhoods, so the elementary schools weren't integrated until much later uh, because the blacks did live in a geographically separate part of town, but they did go immediately in 1955 to the junior high school, one of the two junior high schools, the closest one, and to the high school. Um, but again, that was another sort of saga of my father in Oak Ridge. But again, it gives you a picture of you know, the way people you know, sort of lived this community. Um, they built it, they felt, they felt that it was theirs. Um, there was a great you know, involvement and attachment to the community that I think was really fairly unique uh, for these founding, founding fathers, sort of. Um, so I, there, there's a story actually um, got written up, but it, this happened to me when I was, I guess it was in 1954, after the Supreme Court decision. I was 10 years old, um, went to the local Pine Valley barber shop to get my hair cut, and I'm sitting in the barber's chair, and in comes Mr. Brewer, who lived not too far down the street from where I'd grown up, but who was a, a real Southern anti-evolutionist, anti-integrationist. So when he comes in and he's complaining loudly to the barbers how it was that Jew Cone who got the Supreme Court to integrate the school, and it was all his fault. And I'm sort of slinking down in my chair, saying maybe they won't notice me. <laughs> um, but we, you know, it was a tough time actually during that recall election. We got calls, you know, threatening the us as children and, you know, we're going to get you and, you know, you're a Jew nigger lover, um, that kind of thing. Um, again, this was not from the whole community and certainly not from the scientific community, but again, it made you realize that you were living in a, a southern town in some ways, which I think I was fairly insulated from otherwise, because again, we moved in our own little sort of social circle and everybody's father was a scientist and a genius of some sort, <laughs> that kind of uh, kind of thing. Following on that was mm -hmm. that was wonderful. Following on those lines, you mentioned that Margaret Mead had come to town. Yeah, and I don't remember when that was, and I think it was probably in the either the late fifties or the early sixties. I may have actually been out of town by then. I went to college in nineteen sixty one. Um, I don't know exactly when it was, and Margaret Mead had um, looked at Oak Ridge again as a sociologist would, and was interested in what this community could be like. That, as I think she was quoted saying, a community with no grandmothers. Because um, again, everybody was young; nobody had family that was from that area. Um, there were no grandmothers; there was no history to it, and so she came to Oak Ridge to sort of see what what the sociology was like. And I think she was pretty unflattering in her picture of, of the town dynamics and of the women in town and you know, these uh, women who had no, who didn't work, but were highly educated. Anyhow, I, I don't know what she wrote, <laughs> but I know that everybody got their back up and there were a flood of letters written to Margaret Mead about this and those have been gathered into a book it was published in 1975 by a, actually a friend of my parents, Thelma Present, um, who actually lived in Knoxville actually at that time. 
but um, the letters from Oak Ridge to Margaret Mead is the, the name of the book, I think. Um, and it'd be interesting to sort of see what, what the two sides had to say about the culture of Oak Ridge and different ways of viewing it. That's great. Um, Noah, can you tell us more about uh, the Weinbergs? Um, well, the Weinbergs came to Oak Ridge, I think, a little later, probably something like 1948 or something like that. Um, um, I don't know how my parents met the Weinbergs particularly, but they became very, very close friends. My mother used to spend an hour on the phone with Marge Weinberg every morning over coffee. Uh, it was just a ritual to, uh, <laughs> to uh, call up and just chew the fat and so on. Um, they had two children, one who was a year older than me and one that was two years younger um, than me. And the older one, David, and I became really best friends and you know, from an early age were playing together. You know, there are stories of us uh, you know, building a fire under Alvin's nice grand piano um, in the living room, <laughs> trying to build a fire at ages three and four, something like that. Um, but we, we were, you know, best friends and, um, the two families were very close. I lived with the Weinbergs at times when my parents would travel, um, that kind of thing. Um, Alvin, of course, went on to become the director of the Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Um, he was a, say, a good amateur musician. Um, I know when my father died, he... Um, Alvin was giving a eulogy to him uh, at the memorial service and said, you know, he was my best friend and my worst critic. Because my father was always very direct about his uh, criticism of Alvin's piano playing or of anything else, political things and so on. Uh, my father was a very um, sort of firm in his convictions and beliefs about things. And he... Um, would tell people when he disagreed with them. And I think people valued that in some ways, but also he was a tough, a tough act. He was a, a tough guy in that way. Um, so my best friend and my worst critic. <laughs> um, what did he think about the atomic bomb? Well, I think from what I've heard him say and so on over the years, that There really, the, uh, before the bomb was exploded, there was very little attention to what it might do or how it, how it might be used. There was a furor, a, a frenzy almost to, to get it built. A tremendous fear of Germany having the bomb. He also, I think, had a real fear of Japan uh, being a West Coast person. He, I know, sort of had a feeling all through the, the late 30s of, Japan sort of expanding and expanding and expanding into um, more areas, into Korea and, and China and so on, and um, sort of saw this threat from the Pacific also. So I think there was really this focus on winning the war and not much philosophizing about it. Once the bomb was almost ready to go, though, people began to consider it, and he actually was one of the group who sent a letter um, to the president um, urging him not to use the bomb. Um, they tried to, uh, I guess this is usually called the Zillard letter, um, but he was one of the signatories of that. And um, of course, that decision was not made in Oak Ridge um, to use it, but a lot of people did think that it should be demonstrated rather than, than used and so on. Um, clearly that didn't come about. And after the war, he was very vocal about turning the control of atomic energy over to civilian control and attempting to internationalize it. And he actually testified a couple of times at Congress about that, um, about the need to, to um, to, you know, not keep this as a, a secret, not to keep it with the military. Um, uh, again, that didn't, go very far, although I guess we did have civilian control of the Atomic Energy Commission and so on was formed. Um, 
So he was, he was politically active in that sort of way. Um, and this is in the 46, 47, 48 probably period. Um, and again, I only know that from stories I've read rather than personal experience. So what did he think of the hydrogen bomb? I don't know that he thought anything about that. I mean, is that at that point, he's not really connected to even to atomic energy particularly, and certainly not in the loop in terms of the science going on around, around that. Um, his concerns had shifted totally towards biological science, towards where he had come from, and really had no connection to the, uh, the nuclear side of, of Oak Ridge. Um, you know, certainly he knew about the kinds of reactors that were being developed and so on, and was friends with people who were involved in that, like Alvin Weinberg. But Oak Ridge really was not, I don't think, central to the hydrogen bomb in any meaningful way. Um, again, we were friends with the, one of the fathers of the hydrogen bomb, Hans Bethe, was a good friend of my parents and so on. We, I met him and played with his kids and so on um, also, but, um, but I don't think there was anything particular. He always was a little bit of a cynic about the fear of atomic energy and about um, your radiation. He thought there was a, a lot of sort of media hysteria about that. Um, you know, I know that you know, people talk about plutonium being the most dangerous chemical in the world and how it's tiny, tiny, tiny bit can kill you. And my father would, would say that, you know, you could hold plutonium in your hand and it won't do anything to you. It's an alpha emitter and its radiation doesn't even pierce the skin. Um, it's only if it's inhaled the right size pieces and, and so on, that then it can be very dangerous. But it was like, you know, this, uh, he thought it was sort of a, a boogeyman that people had created of, you know, this fear of radiation of, and so he was pretty cynical about that kind of aspect of the popular press. Um, and probably that extends to other, other kinds of um, you know, applications of science and so on. I think he would probably be um, you know, less than, well, not less than scared, but you know, really welcoming of things like genetically modified foods or whatever. I mean, those things didn't scare him. He thought they were understandable and, you know, and controllable. And I think he would point to the, the positive outcomes of nuclear energy as far outweighing the negatives. Yeah. Um, I know Alvin um, you know, used to argue that the um, atomic and hydrogen bombs are basically what prevented the last 60 years from having major wars, that they were, you know, I'm not sure I agree with all of that, but um, certainly there's an argument to be made that they've uh, sort of made big wars impossible. And who knows? <laughs> but certainly my father would be in that kind of camp, I think. Very hard-nosed. <laughs> When did you realize that Oak Ridge was so special as a place to grow up? I think that was something I always knew and always felt that there was something um, that it was a unique place. I think I, I was sort of born into that sort of, um, and I think, you know, obviously I got that from my, my parents and my parents' friends and so on. Um, this feeling that, again, it was a, a town that had sort of this international connections and this uh, intellectual community that was really sort of unique. Um, that was, you know, not your regular sort of place. And that somehow we were very special because of that. Um, so I think we were brought up, you know, thinking the community was a very special place. And um, sort of this pride of, of place. Now most, I think probably a lot of people grow up in, you know, in Akron, Ohio, and think that's a great place too. Um, but certainly we did, and I think, I think our parents did too. I think so they came to appreciate Oak Ridge as this um, place they had, they had created. And um, so a very special bond.
Um, yeah, I think that was true for, for all my, my friends. Now, very few of them have gone and back to Oak Ridge. Um, you know, it's the sort of place we went to college and went on and went other places. And again, being a town without grandmothers, um, if you want to think of it that way, it means that you know, once my parents' generation began to die off, my connections to Oak Ridge have just gotten weaker and weaker and weaker because there's nothing permanent there. You know, there aren't siblings there and uncles and aunts and, and you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I have almost no reason to go back to Oak Ridge now. There's only a very few people that were friends of my family that are still there. Um, and not very many friends that I knew as children that are still there, which is too bad. I sort of miss that um, at this point. Um, it would be nice to have, have that connection. So maybe there's a, a long-lasting you know, side to this of being brand new and not having a history. And when, when did your parents um, die? Or um, my parents, my f father died in um, 1999, at the age of 89. And my mother died in um, 2007, at the age of 93. And she actually died here in St. Louis. We moved her here just a few months before she died. But other than that, they spent the rest of their lives in Oak Ridge. Both of them. That's great. I hesitate to stop asking questions because you have such nice answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so I'm trying to think if there's, there's other things that. Well, I mean, there, there are other things you know about Oak Ridge. You know, Oak Ridge was a dry community. You probably know that, right? Um, well, yeah, I mean, obviously, it was, this was a, a county where you couldn't buy or sell or or have liquor. Um, I guess, I don't know if it was a statewide thing, certainly it was a, a county-wide um, thing, and it was a dry county. But the scientists all traveled a lot um, to meetings all the time, and whenever they went, they went with you know big empty briefcases or whatever, they came back filled with, with booze. So I think there was a, a fair amount of alcohol available um, in Oak Ridge. Um, but um, it took, a, I think it was a very long time before alcohol was allowed legally um, in Oak Ridge, though. But everybody became bootleggers of one sort or another um, in minor ways. Um, I know that um, you know, in the hills around Oak Ridge, there were um, people making moonshine and, and so on. And there was some suspicion of these people driving around with, um, particularly the officials who had government cars that had license plates that were, you know, marked them as not Tennessee, but government. And often there was sort of a suspicion that these were revenuers and so on. So there was a little friction there between the hill folk and um, who were brewing moonshine and, and the, uh, the locals. To what extent, um, and again, this may not be something mm -hmm. you can answer, but um, the secrecy at Oak Ridge, mm -hmm. how, how did that... Um, Certainly, I was aware of that as a child, and there were signs still around when I was old enough to read signs and, and so on, the sort of loose lips sink ships kind of things. Um, and of course, going in and out of town until, I guess, 1955 or six we'd go through a guarded gate. And it clearly was a city that was behind a fence. Um, and you went through these guard gates and you had to stop and, you know, the guard would check your IDs or whatever and look in the trunk sometimes. But, you know, clearly it was, that was part of the deal. I mean, that was, you know, um, something I was aware of from pretty early on that there was a secrecy to it. Now, I don't think it was quite like it was during the war. Um, where things were very secret and nobody talked about uranium and they all had code words for this and that and the other. And particularly the women, I think, were really sort of in the dark um, about 
what the heck was going on. They knew, you know, they knew it was a big project, they knew it was involved in ending the war, and they knew, you know, things like that, but any details. Um, but even up until, say, the early 50s, and really until the town opened up in 55, there was definitely a feeling that this was a, a, a place separated from the outside. Um, and of course, there was this big opening of the gates, big celebrations and so on, and parades and fireworks and so on. They, actually, I think they blew up Elsa Gate, maybe. I think in a public sort of thing where they actually exploded it um, to sort of announce the opening of Oak Ridge and you know, the end of sort of government control of the town, the government running of the town. It became a civilian place <laughs> like others. But yeah, I think, I think everyone I knew grew up in Finland. It was a very special, very special place, something that was different. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you more about my father's yeah. later career oh. and so on, but that I don't know if that's of interest. Well, why would yeah. you give a, a thumbnail sketch? Great. Well, he, um, again, used these separation techniques to um, isolate and identify the components of RNA, ribonucleic acid. And from his work, he showed, he, he discovered the structure of RNA, the binding that connects one nucleotide to another, which turns out is the same in DNA, but it was less clear in RNA, more difficult to, to show. So, and this was right in the period where the structure of DNA was finally got discovered in 1953, but he was involved in, in this developing the structure of RNA in 1951, 52, 53, 54, all through that. And sort of really part of this very exciting opening up of, of nucleic acid research. Um, he went on actually after he retired to editing a volume called Progress in Nucleic Acid Research for, I don't know, 15, 20 years after, sort of before and after retirement. Um, and he actually devoted more and more of his time and later in his career to editing um, things like that. He became, um, he was part of a nomenclature commission that you know, figured out how to name these compounds and organize them and so on, really using more of his chemistry uh, background. Uh, but that was his research area, was in the, the structure of RNA. And RNA, of course, turned out to be um, discovery much more important than we ever thought um, in controlling how genes are expressed and, and so on in cells. It's a major player. It's not just this sort of temporary copy of DNA that's involved in protein synthesis. It has many more roles. So I know his friend, again, Alvin Weinberg, thought that that was, um, again, something that probably deserved more recognition than he got. Um, you know, that, that RNA actually turned out to be more, more important than it first was thought to be. And um, you know, according to Alvin, at least he was nominated for the Nobel Prize at one point for this, some of this work. Um, so it was, it was good stuff. So he had really had two major scientific you know, achievements. The radioisotope program was one that came directly out of the war effort, and then this work in nucleic acid research. Uh, and he, so he, you know, he was pretty well known. Traveled a lot. When I was a child, we went to Europe. When I was eight, and we went and lived for a year there. And when I was eleven, um, and he went many, many times on, you know, to speak and visit universities and so on. So. Had quite a quite a good scientific career as well as a music career. <laughs> Had both. <laughs>